So, get comfy. I think the camera's already rolling. I hope it already is, because that'd be funnier. All right. Hi, everybody. I keep now I'm looking over here. Maybe if I put it, no, because then it's going to be like that for you. Ooh, I can move myself. I think our water filter is out or needs to be replaced. I can hear the dingy dingy. All right, let's settle down. Let's get started. Austin, are you ready to get started? You need to sit down. Back of the room. Yep, sit down. I see Blake has late, walked in late once again. Right now, people are like, huh? I'm just picturing what the class used to look like. I miss it. Is what it is. Let's get started. Uh, come on up to the front of the room and grab a Chromebook. I can't do that either. So ignore that. But hey, we're going to talk about GFI's electrical fixtures. Thank you. I don't get this service in my room where somebody brings me a glass of water. There's no ice in here. Did you not get ice? No. Oh, that's, yeah, I'm already interrupting it. They're like, oh, my gosh. It's so again. <laughs> now I'm going to drink my water. What are you going to do about it? Thank you. All right. In all seriousness, let's talk about GFI's electrical fixtures. Uh, let's see here. Hit the button. Learning targets for today. Uh, what's a GFI? What do they do? Uh, do, I, do I need these in my house? I'm sure there's something to do with electrical because that's what we've been talking about. McMullen, you lied to us. You said you're going to do hands-on stuff today. Didn't lie. I just forgot about the GFI part. Let's talk about this. Uh, then we're also going to talk about outlets and switches for your house. And then um, powered vents in high moisture places. We're going to talk about that. And then uh, just some light fixtures. We'll talk about different things. There's a bazillion out there that you can choose from. All right. Hey, surprise, that Chromebook you pulled? No, no ignore this. We, you, you don't have a Chromebook. We're not actually in school. You're learning digitally. This is not a dream. Nope, definitely not a dream. <laughs> kind of a nightmare probably for some people. But, yeah, again, we'll get through it. All right, let's talk about this. GFI outlets. Um, GFCI is actually the technical term, but most people just call them GFIs. So I don't know why they, they, they got rid of the C. But most people call them GFIs short. Excuse me. Stands, stands for ground fault interrupt or circuit interrupt. So the idea of the GFCI or G, yeah, commonly called GFI is that it's 100% there to prevent electrical shock. They are highly sensitive, little tiny circuit breakers. That's really what they are. They amount, they monitor the amount of flow coming from hot and going to neutral. If there's any imbalance, it trips the circuit, and it's able to sense a mismatch in four to five milliamps. I mean, milliamps. Uh, you know, again, your your hair dryer is pulling like well, five thousand milliamps so i mean you're talking a very minute amount with that being said um there are some bad things about gfcis too every i just had to yawn i gotta get it out i tried to cover it up with water but it ain't gonna happen there are some bad things too um the good thing is they can react and it's up and down in one thirteenth of a second i mean and faster you can blink faster than i can snap my fingers any of that it, it's it's happening Here's what they look like. You're probably going, oh, I've got these in my bathroom. Or, oh, I've seen these before where you click the button and it goes click. Or, man, they're always are clicking on me. Well, that's because something's wrong. Good thing about these is it prevents electrical shock. That's why code now says you got to have them in wet areas of your house. Uh, kitchens and bathrooms must have these and basements. So the bad thing about these are the more they get tripped, the more sensitive they actually become to the point of where sometimes they just they automatically trip and they you can't even use them anymore. The other bad thing about these is gotta do it. Um, the other bad thing about these is if you have just a tiny bit of moisture on the end of your plug and you plug it in, it'll trip them, uh, which is probably a good thing, but probably normally wouldn't do anything. So sometimes they're almost too sensitive, but it's better to be safe than sorry on these. And the one, there's two buttons. There's a reset and a test. The test actually trips it, purposely trips it to make sure it works. If it doesn't go click when you trip it, uh, you got a bad GFCI. Toss it out. We already talked about that. 
test them. Hey, look it. You use your UL tested. Uh, it's a joke. Underwriter laboratory. Uh, where do we need to put these? Bathrooms, kitchen counter areas, laundry areas. There has been talk. Ooh. Ever since, I mean, this slideshow now, I think it's going on six years. We've been talking about putting them in a children's bedroom just because of the electrical shock. I think they're going to probably, I, I, it's not code yet, but I think what probably made it where this will never become code is now they have those safety outlets where both prongs have to be pushed in at the same exact time. Otherwise, there's, they're actually covered up. They're tamper proof outlets. Just put those in. Unless your kid's smart enough where they can bend the paper clip perfectly straight on both ends and then stick it in. I mean, they deserve to be shocked, right? Uh, lots of options for outlets. I put these in my own house. Oh, good golly. Um, five years ago, they were like 20 bucks a piece. Now they've come way down. I got one in my garage, too. The bad thing about these is that... I'm sorry. My yawning is bad. Uh, the bad thing about, oops, I forgot I got a touch screen. Uh, the bad thing about these is your mother-in-law comes over, takes that USB plug, and puts it in the wrong way for her phone, and doesn't understand why it's not going in, so she jams it in, and then the little plastic tongue or, tongue or prong inside there breaks off, and then they're junk. Just saying. I knew a guy. So uh, be aware of that. But they are nice. Light switches. There are tons of options besides on and off. I gotta stop. What are we up to? Four or five yawn? It's gonna become a game pretty soon for you guys. I feel bad. They're all hooked up the same way. Um, two hots, one on, one off. When you flip the switch, the on, then transfers to the other one, and then they complete the circuit. It's got a ground. Neutrals don't even play in, uh, to effect with a switch. Let's talk about the options for switches. Dimmer switches. I mean, we. I think we know what they do by now. Hey, look at TV and that switch right there is a dimmer switch. If I go over and go like this, it'll get dimmer in here and brighter. Uh, the old 1950s, late 60s was actually a rheostat where the... Uh, they generated some heat because the idea was that electricity came in and in order to get rid of like, you know, hey, I want to bring the electricity down so it dims the light. So we only need to use 10 volts instead of the 120. Well, that leftover went into the rheostat, which heated up to expel the extra electricity, essentially. Um, they don't use them anymore. Now we've went to actual true dimmer switches where we can electronically control things. There's a, you know, the slider. There's these ones, the old, you know, you push in and it goes click click and it shuts on or shuts off the light, turns on the light, and then once it's on, you can turn it up and down. There's these ones. I like these. They're the size of a normal switch, but right next to the actual switch is a little dimmer, so you can adjust your lighting. The bad thing about these I found out I have them in my bedroom is when I should have put them, we've got a two-way switch. So that, you know, when you come into the bedroom, you can switch it. And if you go by the bathroom, it controls the same light. I should have put the actual dimmer by the one in the bathroom because it's less likely to get used. When you come in, I've noticed like, you know, you unconsciously just flip the light with the side of your finger. A lot of times you'll take the switch, the dimmer part, and you'll go from dull to like, whoa, really bright in here. So there is a little bit of a downside to that, but they are nice. Motion sensing switches. Uh, hands free. You walk into a room, it turns on. These are great for kids because if they can't reach the light, light on it turns on. Um, those that are handicapped, maybe are you know elderly that have an issue. I put down chronologically challenged. Um, the bad thing about them is your dog, your cat goes in. They're turning on the lights day or night. You know, if it's outside, there's a bird or something. Who, who knows? They turn on. I've got a, a motion light outside, and you know it'll be on, and you'll look out there like, oh, is there a criminal? Is somebody sneaking up? And then you know, next you know, it's a skunk or something. You're like, oh, you know, Pepe Le Pew's out there. So good things and bad things. I helped my neighbor put one in his bathroom out in his uh, garage. Why? And you're like, why? Why would he want one in there? Because think about it, in a garage, you're constantly, you know, you're going to work on your car. You're going to, you know, whatever, you know, fiddle around. Your hands get dirty. You go in to wash them and what? You got to hit the switch. 
No, you just walk in, light turns on. It's funny because I noticed even him, when he walks in, his hand goes out like he's going to turn on the switch, but then he remembers like halfway you know, with the motion. He's like, oh, yeah, dimmer switch. It's already on. Your muscle memory is kind of funny in that aspect. There's a, just a standard dimmer switch. It still does have an actual override on-off. Timers, uh, probably not going to be good if you run it, you know, just in your house because you're going to be like, you know, hey, we normally eat at 6 o'clock, so I'll have the, time, you know, the timer turn on the table light. You know, then it's like seven, you're eating late one night, and you're like, mm, it's dark in here. But what they are good for is you can run them like normal lights on off. And then when you're gone, program it so that it does turn on different lights throughout your house. So many studies have shown in that last sentence in this slide that, you know, you're le likely to be broken into if, you know, they drive by and they see the lights are on. They drive by again and then they see some lights been turned off and some other lights been turned on. And they're going, oh, there's probably somebody in there. We're going to keep driving tonight. So it's a great thing to, you know, great thing to have if, if, you know, program them for different times to turn on and off throughout your house. Who knows, maybe pre a, a, uh, a break in. And there's a timer with a little switch that, you know, lifts up and covers back up so it looks nice. Things to avoid with these, uh, all of these. Choose whatever one you want for your house. And then this second thing, be aware of the little green monsters. I'm not crazy. I'm not talking about men from Mars. Yeah, I put in there, I am a little crazy. I'm talking about all those little green LED lights and all your fixtures. I mean, think about it. You know, back in the day, I could say, oh, the VCR that's blinking or the light on the VCR or your DVD player. I look at my own home right now. Well, we're in the dining room kitchen area. The light is on above the stove. There is a little LED light on for the ice maker slash water thing for the fridge. I've got a Glade plug-in, plugged in. Uh, all those things, oh, the light for the or the microwave uh, uh, clock, all those things are using electricity. Do I need them on? Is there ways to shut them off? No, I can, I, I mean, I can unplug the Glade and none of the other ones I can't really. So be aware of those things. Uh, they, they do use up electricity. I mean, even if you're only spending, you know, 25 cents a month, it doesn't sound like much. You're going to really make a big deal about it. Money's money. It adds up. Let's talk about light fixtures. Uh, we're going to go through the different types and their names. Ceiling mounted fixtures. The chandelier has two requirements in order to be called a chandelier. It has to hang from a chain or cable from the ceiling. It must hang. There's no such thing as a chandelier on you know, a wall, it has to hang from a ceiling. And it has to have more than one light. If it's a single light, it's not a chandelier, it's a pendant. There's a chandelier. Uh, and then a standard light fixture. I put down, don't put these in livable areas, they look bad. These are the ones like you see in a basement or a closet where it has the pull string, like click, 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 click. Or maybe it is hooked to a switch, but it's just a ceramic insulator with where you screw in a light bulb. Again, you don't want that in your living room. Like, hey, come on over. People are going to be like, am I being interrogated in here? Like, mm -mm. so there's what I'm talking about. That's a really gross one. Uh, but again, this is what I'm talking about as far as a standard fixture. Chandelier, chandelier, still a chandelier. Hangs from ceiling. It's made out of some kind of critter animal, antlers, and, you know, multiple lights. Still a chandelier. McMullen, you're not showing the chandelier like I have in my house. Do you know how many different light fixtures there are? No way I'm going to be able to show them all. Dome lights, uh, typically we use them in a hallway, entries, maybe on a porch. Uh, what makes it a dome light? It's the shape of the glass or the fixture. Hey, dome light. I've got two of these in my hallway. T lights, uh, also called pennant or bar lights. These also hang from the ceiling, but here's what makes them different from a chandelier. They got one light. They're great for kitchen countertops, you know, those island bars. What what islands bars in your house? Uh, in my entryway coming into the house, I have a single, you know, pendant light. It's nautical-ish theme, but it's still a pendant light. It's not a actual chandelier. Gives a modern style to a house and just looks nicer than, a, you know, I'm not going to have a giant chandelier in my little back entryway, and I don't want one of those little white ceramic things where you screw in the light bulb. And a dome light, eh. So it's something different. Hey, there's a whole bunch of different pendant lights. Fluorescent tube lighting. 
This is what's common in offices. And I really should update this because now the fluorescent tube light, it's going bye-bye. LEDs, LED tube, or I shouldn't say tube lights, but that tube style LED, they're cheap now. In fact, uh, I have one above my workbench in the garage and I loved it. You turned on the, I had it wired up so that when you came in the garage, you turned it on and it you know, turns on as, or turn, ah, me, me. when I turn on the actual garage lights, that um, uh, fluorescent LED, or yeah, I can't talk or think now, but I had it, I had it wired up so that when you came into my garage and turned on just the main lights, that tube light came on above the workbench, which was awesome, lit everything up, but then uh, two weeks ago, the ballast burned out, I thought it was bulbs, you know, I had some spare, you know, fluorescent bulbs, they were great, bad thing, or they were fine, the, the ballast inside there wasn't good, so it was junk. Uh, thanks to the invention of something called Amazon, uh, I ordered one. I felt bad with the quarantine. I'm thinking somebody's risking their life working at Amazon to send me a new light. But I'm like, you know, I need a light. I need to be able to see. So I did my research. A standard fluorescent tube light, like a double one for just above a workbench, is 3,000 lumens. That's the brightness scale. I'm like, okay, so I got to find something equivalent. Well, for 30 bucks, I found one on Amazon that's 10,000 lumens. You go into my garage now, and it's like, I can see my bones. It's it's bright. It, it's impressive. And for $30, I was like, this is reasonable. I don't know how long it's going to last. I assume they had a great review, so we'll try it. But that's my fluorescent tube LED store, conversion story. Uh, if you're building your own garage or anything from now on, or a, a shop of some type of your own, just just put an LED. Stay away from the fluorescent tubes, offices, any of that. Go to LED. You can get warmer colors, so they're not that plain, plain Jane white look. So the fluorescent tube light, it was always common in offices. If you go to the school right now, everything's fluorescent tube. They are slowly replacing them to LEDs. If a, LED, if a fluorescent tube burns out, they're putting LEDs in place. Keep in mind, the fluorescent tube lighting is very energy efficient, but an LED is even more efficient. The bad thing about fluorescent tubes, like, you know how it is. Like, you sit underneath them, and you just, like, feel like your, like, soul is being sucked from you. Like, they're just, they don't have warmth. They're just light. Uh, very plain look. Where do you see these in a house? Garages. Uh, kind of, the, I put down refinished. Basement. Sometimes they have nicer looking ones in a finished basement, but and again, go LED now. Don't buy the actual fluorescent tubes. Keep in mind too, fluorescent tubes are an environmental danger to humans and our actual environment. Um, in order to create that fluorescent tube, there is a small, 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 small amount of mercury in each one of those tubes. So if you see an internet video where you know people are taking them like and hitting each other and they're breaking, yeah, guess what? They're also exposing themselves to mercury. Don't do that. There's one. My parents had one like that in the entryway in their kitchen. Eh. Bathroom fan slash lights. It is code. If you have a bathroom with a shower or bathtub, you have to have a fan now. It used to be that you just need an outside window. Uh-uh. Not anymore. You need a fan. And the fan must vent outside. Um. Uh, don't let it vent to just an eave or a vent in this, you know, like a, like, oh, that vent right there is for the, uh, for the roof to breathe. I'll just take the pipe and run to that. No, it has to have its own separate vent. It cannot be blocked. Uh, also, you should have it insulated because it's going to be going through an attic. You're going to be carrying hot, moist air through, you know, a cold environment. It can condense in that pipe. So have it insulated so it doesn't condense. Why do we need a fan? I put down van. Eh, van for vents. Why do we need a fan? Prevent molds and ickies. Remember, any living thing on Earth needs a couple things to survive. Food, water, oxygen. If we can get rid of one of those elements, it can't survive. So you get rid of that water, you know, part of the equation, and guess what? It's got food and got oxygen, but no water, not surviving. Also, this is the best advice I can give you on a bathroom fan. They're rated by the square footage of the room. So if you've got a 10 by 10, you know, 100 square foot bathroom, you need to find a fan that's rated for that. Don't buy the one that says good for rooms of 100 square feet. Buy the one up that says like good for 150 square feet. Go bigger. 
trust me, you won't be disappointed. Go bigger. The faster you can get that air, that moist, hot air out of there, the better. And also, like, I made the mistake before. I bought one that was sized, you know, for the bathroom. It meets code. But it, we talked about this. Meeting code means, like, getting a D minus in class. You passed the class. Did you really do the best you could? No. I guess you passed. Buying a fan that's exactly the size you need that meets code is the same thing as I like get a D minus. Get a B or a, a, an A. You know, buy, buy one that's much bigger than what you need. You'll be happy. Uh, and now, too, with some of the pictures I'm going to show you, they're not just as simple as a vent. They're now a vent with light with this. Uh, the new bathroom we put in, it's just, it doesn't have the light, but it's a fan and Bluetooth speaker. Now you're like, huh? I love it. I absolutely love it. In the morning, literally just take my phone and I'll put it on whatever, you know, for me it's NPR or whatever. And while I'm taking a shower and getting ready in the morning, the bathroom fan's running and it, the speaker's on talking, you know, it, it's Science Fridays or whatever it may be on NPR. And I'm going, this is awesome. It's just that new element. My wife picked it out. And I just went with it. I thought, this is dumb. What, what, what am I going to need a speaker in the bathroom? You know, I'm not one that's going to be sitting there singing in the shower or anything like that. And then I'm like, no, yeah, listen to the news in the morning. It's really nice. I like it. Hopefully she didn't hear that. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Here's a picture of a bathroom in the pink. Uh, you can see they have the fan. It runs through a ductwork. This should be insulated now on the outside. And then to an actual roof vent or a wall vent again, but we need to directly vent it to the outside. Hey, there we go. It's a fan. Huh. Keep on. Uh, it's a fan slash light combo. Uh, here's a no no. See this? This is up in an attic. They've got insulation down cool. There's their bathroom fan covered with insulation. That's fine. This is where the problem is, okay? There comes our, our vent, it's just some flexi hose. I, I would insulate, or buy insulated hose. It's all up to what your building inspector says, and but that's me. And then there's soffit vents, where there's those little dimpled holes on the outside of your soffit. They just let the hose sit down on top of that. And what's happened? Look at all that beautiful black yummy mold, because hot, moist air coming up into the attic equals bad. Really bad. Okay, this was a flood. You could tell because look at it, it's a perfect straight line right there. But again, black mold, bathroom bad. Also, that's a lot of like rust in the sink, even without the the flooding. Like, ugh. this is typically how you end up finding the black mold, though. You peel up wallpaper or something, and then behind it is just not good. Again. Black mold is a living thing in order, or any molds, food, water, oxygen. Get rid of the water aspect, and guess what? You're not living anymore. Ceiling fans. Uh, just We're not talking about bathroom fans. We're just talking about those fans that spin around and around above your head out, you know, and whether it's your bedroom or whatever. They're proven to reduce energy uh, usage and lower your bill. Why? Because you're actually regulating air better. You're mixing the air. Remember, hot air rises. So in the winter, you can have it actually take and pull. So that way it's pulling that cold air up to the top of your ceiling, mixing with the hot, and it blends better. Same thing in the summer. You've got cold air down below. Well, if I blow the hot air down and it mixes, it's a little bit more even of a temperature. Buy a good brand. Uh, and again, they make them now with actually like uh, heaters built in. They make remote controls. Our one of the bedrooms or remote control, it's kind of nice. You can sit there in the middle of the summer, you're like, still kind of hot. Click, ah, that's better. You don't have to get up and put the little, you know, pull cord that inevitably will break. Uh, Hunter is a great brand. Uh, there's another one, like Panama or something like that. That's a great bed. But Hunter is the big name brand. Buy a name brand. Don't buy a cheapy. I've learned the hard way multiple times where it's like, oh, 40 bucks. That's a lot better than that $100 Hunter one. Forty dollars last you about two years. The hunters that we have in our house, the one in the kitchen here, is now eleven years old. And it turns on, turns off, and works. 
Uh, the big thing too with a ceiling fan, the box that it mounts to has to be rated for a ceiling fan. You can't just use any type of box. Remember, you got a lot of weight hanging down there. Same with a chandelier. Make sure the box is rated or it's at least secured. Ceiling fan, the bat fan. These come in all different kinds. I mean, there's like that one where it looks, you know, kind of tropical-ish. This one's cool. It actually folds up, and then when it, like, centrifugal force causes it to open up when it starts to spin. Different look, retro. And then the good old-fashioned, just, you know, nickel and, and wood. Outdoor lighting, uh, tons of options. There's everything from, you know, that those solar lights you can put around your house all the way to what we're calling hardwired lights around your landscape. The biggest reason to have lights outside is security. That, that's the biggest reason. Number two is looks. A lot of people, you know, like to put, you know, lights strategically in their garden beds and maybe, you know, up in the eave, some light shining down and then it looks nice. The real reality of it is a lit up home is less attractive to be burgled than a house that's not. So again, we're doing it for security purposes. And I know it's sad. We live in a day and world where you're like, really? Yeah, there's unfortunately for, you know, 300 good people, there's one bad person, or whatever the statistics are. So outdoor lighting. Yard lights were probably the most common because it lights up a large area, and it just kind of says, hey, there's a house here. Uh, they're now going to LED for everything on that. Low, you know, electrical usage. Before it was a mercury vapor light, like it was a big light bulb that was filled with mercury, and the mercury would heat up, vaporize, and then all that mercury would just shine, and that's that bright white glow you see from those yard lights. Then they went to sodium vapor. Sodium is not mercury, so it's already better for you know the environment and us if it breaks. And sodium are those yellow floodlights you can see in people's yards. Now, if you see a white light that's really, really white, it's probably LED. Porch lights, again, they invite guests in. They can be motion activated to scare people away. All shapes and size. They have the ones that kind of have like a yellow tip that are supposed to attract bugs. They still attract bugs. Bugs like light. Uh, and again, the, the shapes and sizes of all these we've talked about. So many options. There's your standard floodlight. Uh, notice on the top that blue thing. That's an eye. It should be pointed, I believe, to the east. Don't quote me on that. Because east. I can never remember. I have to look it up. Um, but that it's a photo eye so that when the sun sets, light turns on. When the sun comes back up, shuts off. Uh, also, follow the directions on, you know, your electrical hookups. Uh, I'll, story for another day on that one with a yard light. My grandpa, well, I'll tell you now. My grandpa, they put a new yard light up. My grandpa was down in the basement going, uh. I think that new one's 220 volts. And I'm like, that can't be right. Oh, that thing was bright. I mean, like that mercury vapor light back then and during that time was like, wow, that thing's really bright. And then all of a sudden, Poof. it's not 220, Grandpa. I guess not. <laughs> uh, barn style lights, they call them. Recess lights. Also called CAN, C-A-N lights. These are those ones that actually sit up in the ceiling. Uh, there's two types. Be aware. There's contact and non-contact. Contact means like you can put insulation right up to them. Doesn't hurt anything. Won't catch on fire. There's the ones, though, that actually have very low clearance that you put a halogen light in and that little can gets hot. You got insulation and stuff up there in the attic. Uh, you have a fire. So be aware of which one. Same with moist areas, uh, like in showers and bathrooms. Be, make sure that they're rated for it. Can lights, they give that really nice look. I like the person down there reading some type of print material. I think those were called newspapers. And then here's what they look like before that drywall goes up in the ceiling. Uh, they go between your actual joist bays, and you can move them left or right a little, you know, on those metal sticks you see, basically. They're cheap. They're just pressed out, you know. I think you pick up a can light for like 11 bucks, and then the inserts that go in them after you have it, you know, put up and everything for a few more bucks. All right, that's me talking a lot less of me yawning. Uh, here's what we're gonna have you do for today. This should look familiar, 
as in like, oh, we're drawing again. Yeah, you're going to draw again. How do I turn this in? I can't turn it into Google. You're right. You, you know, maybe you can, yeah, you should be able to upload a document or a picture. If not, just email me or send it to remind. Somehow somebody was complaining, like, Mon, how do I turn in, you know, my assignments? I don't understand. I have an answer for all those types of questions. If somebody said, hey, I'll give you a million dollars if, you know, you can somehow get this to McMullen in digital format, I'm pretty sure you could take a picture and email it to me, take a picture and send it through mine, draw it and send it. There's ways to get it to me. No excuses. Uh, and if you don't have internet access, uh, Get a hold of the school. We, there's so many options out there. There's well, if you don't have internet access, how are you watching this? All right, so here we go for today. I'm gonna have you draw out a floor plan of your dream house. Do not draw out your actual house. I don't need blueprints because then I'm gonna feel like James Bond and it's like, okay, where's the nuclear reactor in your house? So no, don't. And also, don't put a nuclear reactor in your dream house. That's just dangerous. Uh, Draw a floor plan of your dream house. Just one of the stories. If you have like five stories in your dream house, just pick one, label it, you know, somewhere on there to tell me what you're drawing. And then include all the rooms on that floor and label them. This is the bedroom. This is the dining room. Include all doors and windows. Remember, we talked about how to draw those. Then tell me where the lights and outlets will be located. Outlets mark with a small circle on each part of the wall. Where you think they would go, remember about every six feet. And then where lights are going to go, put an X. And then mark light switches with a star. And then the last one, what kind label what kind of outlet or light it's going to be. So if you said, hey, there's gonna be a light here in the middle of the bedroom, cool. What kind of light is it? Is it a dome light? Is it a fluorescent light? Is it LED? What what is it? What kind of outlet? If you want to sit there and make a little key and say, hey, all the circles are standard outlets, but the one circle that has an X or a uh, you know, triangle in it or something is the one with the USB plug, fine. Or you can just say, hey, all my outlets are standard. That's fine. Any questions? None. Awesome. No. <laughs> I miss being at school. So... With that being said, this is your assignment. Remember, you got one week to complete these. One week, no more. When Thursday rolls around next week, if you send me something on Friday or even something at like 2 o'clock on Thursday, guess what's going to happen? Sorry. I'd love to say, hey, we'll take it, but no. So these are the rules. This is what we set forth. If you got any questions at all, and if you're truly having problems trying to figure out how to do this, uh, Get a hold of me through Remind, uh, through email, and we'll set up a Zoom meeting. Uh, we can, you know, we can walk through these. I, whatever it takes to get you working, I'm happy. Whatever it takes to get you learning, I'm happy. Enjoy your weekend. I, I know Friday is supposed to be cold, but hopefully the weekend. I, I haven't looked at the weather. I'm, I'm hoping it's nicer, but I can't promise. I feel like the weathermen lately have been like, just yeah, we'll make it up. Because they'll say, like, hey, it's it's going to be nice and beautiful tomorrow. Then I go out and it's like, it's, it's raining and cold. They lied to me again. <laughs> so I'm, I'm noticing some things. And I notice they're all working from home. So maybe they don't have the computer technology that, you know, and the radar access. I don't know. But that's not even related to class. Why are you talking about it, McMullen? I'm just talking to talk now, evidently. Yep. <laughs> so enjoy your weekend. Again, you got a week to do this. If you got any questions at all, send me a you know a message or remind, email me, whatever it takes. Passenger pigeon, if you can find one of those, they've been extinct for a number of years, but just a regular pigeon, send me a message. Um, I prefer no smoke signals because that means there's probably a fire. That's not a good thing. Uh, if you want to run telegraph wires, that's fine. Whatever you need to do to get a hold of me. Take care. Be stay safe. And uh, we'll we'll talk to you later next week Tuesday where we're gonna actually wire. I'm excited for that. All right.